Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the CBGS uh, webinar series. Uh, so the this is our third webinar uh, this um, year. And uh, today we are honored to uh, have Dr. Zui Chu from um, Singapore. And um, so the, the uh, presentation of his title is uh, Light Field Modeling and uh, Applications in Complex uh, Urban Scenarios. And um, so uh, uh, first, I will give a brief introduction to uh, Dr. Zhu. Um, Dr. Zhu is a senior scientist at the uh, Institute of uh, High Performance uh, Computing, ASTAR, in uh, Singapore. He was a research assistant professor at the Hong Kong Polytech University and a postdoctoral uh, associate at the uh, MIT Sensible City Lab. Dr. Zhu's uh, study focused on GS science, urban informatics, and uh, solar energy with more than 70 SCI papers published in uh, journals such as IGGS, uh, TGS, uh, the Innovation, Science Bulletin, and um, the Applied Energy. Dr. Chu is uh, an associate editor of uh, Spring Nature uh, Computer Science, uh, editor of Big Earth Data, Energy 360, and uh, young editor of the Innovation and uh, Advances in Applied Energy. He is also the PI and co-PI for several research grants and uh, board of director member of CPGS. Dr. Zhu was the awardee of the Geospatial World 50 Rising Stars 2024. And uh, his study has been uh, reported by uh, Singapore TV, Lianhe Zhaobao, and uh, MIT News. So without further ado, um, let's welcome uh, Dr. Zhu for his uh, presentation. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction given by Professor Wu. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, uh, now uh, I'm very delighted delighted today that I can give uh, uh, this uh, presentation uh, about my past study regarding light field modeling and applications in complex urban scenarios. To start with, let's look at this uh, image. It shows a fascinating and gorgeous song loop, right? So uh, in this scenario, I'd like to ask a, a question. So what is light? People having different background and perception may have different answers to this question, such as uh, people having uh, from physics may have an entirely different uh, understanding of light compared to us in geography, right? Uh, in my personal opinion, light is the most essential daily living complement of the lives. Also, city is uh, light is the uh, one of the most important natural resources. So we want to have an in-depth understanding of light. To start with, we need to um, understand this uh, uh, light field. So I just. Uh, give a preliminary definition about light field, which is a special temporal field formed by the interactions between the light and the complex two uh, objects on Earth. So, uh, wait a second. So in this case, uh, the light field formed by visible light can be classified as a daytime and nighttime light field, or nature illuminate and artificial illuminate light field. Okay, and also single illuminate and composite light, uh, composite illuminate light field. Okay, so in this case, in nature, the light field formed by the sun and the moon is yang and yin, which is also the uh, unity of uh, opposites. During the daytime, the solar light field forms various light, light scale, which can produce natural resources, can create light uh, pollution due to multiple reflections on high albedo surfaces. So if you look at this, uh, if you look at this image, uh, this is a building in London, because the, for the vertical surface, we call the facade, it is not a flat surface, but it looks like an arc. So it's a reflection back and produce a solar accumulation process on the ground. So that can really metal cars 
and even you can cook fried eggs on the ground, okay? So it can also intensify the land uh, urban heat island effect. During the nighttime, the moon, the stars, and light, artificial light can also form unique light scape, which can extend the time and space scale of human activities, beautify the urban landscape, but simultaneously can also cause severe light pollution. Okay, so we find that light field can create important nature resource and also cause severe light pollution. This motivi motivates us um, to raise three questions. So what is the spatial temperature distribution, patterns and even the scaling law of the light field? How can we effectively utilize the light resource? And how can we protect and govern the light environment, such as uh, mitigation of the light pollution? Okay. So, so I think uh, information geography is the right path to answer these uh, critical questions. To start with, we may uh, utilize geospatial technologies to build multi-sourced spatial temporal big data that can be used to model the light field distribution on 3D urban surfaces, okay? And further, we may analyze the uh, spatial temporal distribution. And if we want to utilize the light resource, uh, we may have to develop a multi-objective optimization such as we want to consider the largest solar electricity generation and at the same time minimize the uh, usages of urban services. And also, finally, we can do the geo-visualization. In this specific domain, if we want to utilize solar energy or light sources to generate electricity, we may consider the uh, electricity supply, which to start with, we may consider clear sky radiation, which will be influenced by cloud cover, uh, the latitude of the city, shed shedding effect from terra variation and 3D buildings. So in this case, we can quantify land surface solar radiation that can be used to predict or estimate solar PV electricity generation, which will be uh, transmitted to the unit grid or for uh, battery storage. This will come from the supply uh, perspective. Let's say this is a very unstable uh, electricity supply due to the unstable weather. In the other hand, we may consider the electricity demand or uh, light sources demand, which we can consider electricity consumption and solar charging made by various urban systems, such as the buildings, electronic vehicles, or shared e-scooters. And even we may quantify the socioeconomic and urban uh, environmental impacts. So considering the, uh, the uh, unstability of the electricity supply and the flexibility of electricity demand, we have to find a way to dynamic balance the supply and demand over time and space. So this is the whole uh, uh, framework we want to we want to target. So getting back to this uh, multi-sourced spatial temporal big data, we usually consider land surface solar radiation, which will conclusively determine the light sources right during the daytime. And we need 3D city models to build the shedding effects from the surrounding buildings. And even we should consider heterogeneous albedos. Albedo means the reflection ratio on a surface. Okay. So we need to consider the heterogeneous uh, albedos on 3D urban surfaces. Okay. So let's go to the first section construction of the fundamental GIS uh, databases, datasets. First, we are uh, mapping the horizontal land surface solar uh, distribution. Roughly eight years ago, when I was a PhD student, we've already considered the 
cloud probability distribution uh, in a city, what we, since we want to quantify the uh, spatial heterogeneous uh, solar distribution. And further on, we want to uh, estimate the larger scale and also the high spatial and the temporal distribution of uh, solar irradiation. So with this motivation, we simply developed four uh, machine learning models and we utilized uh, several influential factors for the features such as uh, uh, meteorological data. We calculated uh, clear sky solar irradiation and we uh, got the real observations uh, from the weather stations and we calculated the AOT and COT from Hawaii uh, satellite imagery. Okay, AOT, aerosol optical thickness. COT stands for cloud optical thickness. So uh, based on the training validation, we can select the best model, which can be used for the seasonal solar uh, prediction. And even we can accum uh, accumulate a whole of this uh, uh, seasonal solar distribution to get the, the annual solar land surface solar irradiation. Uh, for example, we have nine stations in China. For each station, we can build an independent model. This model can be used to, uh, to, to map the solar uh, distribution for whole of the country. So in this case, we can have nine estimations and the nine real observations for these nine stations. So we can build this nine by nine or nine times nine uh, matrix for systematic evaluation. Okay, this is the result of, uh, from the seasonal uh, land surface solar radiation distribution and we accumulate it to the annual uh, solar distribution. Okay, further on, uh, for developing countries, especially let's say in China, uh, the city is, develop is developed rapidly we have a very fast reforming such as uh, we, we we pull down the old uh, buildings we build a high scrap skyscrapers and we have reforming over the urban towns or city towns so we want to have the most up updated and also the complete uh, 3d building models or let's say at least 2.5d uh, building models so we were thinking about whether there is a possibility we build such a model purely based on the high spatial resolution of uh, the satellite imagery. Okay, so which uh, we developed uh, the idea is that we simply utilize this uh, high resolution optical satellite imagery to do the uh, rooftop segmentation. Here we call the footprint segmentation model which will get either it is belonging to the uh, footprint or not. Uh, on the other hand, we also utilize the, uh, the semantic segmentation, but we uh, modified the output function, which means uh, uh, instead of just to provide either one or zero, we provide the continuous numerical values to represent the building height. Then we can do this uh, uh, extract a rooftop multiplied by the predicted height to get these predicted footprints and the heights. Okay, this image. Then we do the spatial clustering, uh, such as using the K means for refined heights. And then we do the uh, polygonalization and the boundary regularization. So in this case, we can compare our prediction with the well established city models to. to investigate the effect effectiveness of this uh, uh, idea, let's say. We also utilize the deep lab V3 plus, but here, look at this image. There are shadows, right, shading. So this shading information is important, which indicates the building height. So when we estimate the, this uh, height attribute, we only utilize the internal uh, areas for each patch, get rid of the boundary to get rid of the modulary effect. For the output of, for FSM output, we utilize the sigma uh, activation function versus for HPM, we utilize this uh, RELU function. Okay. This is the uh, output. 
the first rule on the top, that is the real data set, let's say from the observation. And the second rule on, uh, in, on the bottom, that is our prediction. Uh, this is a case study in Shanghai. So we almost covered the whole of the uh, Shanghai's urban area and we achieved fa fairly good result, okay? Uh, now, just now we represent, we, we mentioned this reflection becomes important. So which means that we want to know the heterogeneous albedo information, which means a heterogeneous distribution over reflections on different uh, urban surfaces. So in this thinking, we utilize this street view images and we develop this uh, multi-scale contextual attention network to segment different materials on buildings. Okay, so in this case, it can be used for the solar or light field modeling in the next step. The, also, not only for facade, we also consider the materials on a horizontal surface, such as on the rooftop and, and even ground. But here as a case study, we segmented the uh, rooftop PV areas from the high spatial resolution of satellite imagery. Okay, so hope this study is trying to build uh, the fundamental GIS dataset for build uh, to build the light field model. Okay, this will comes to this section, section two. So, oh, uh, now in ArcGIS Pro. We have aerial solar radiation toolset, which has been widely used. And this toolset considers the direct and the diffuse radiation. It works well for most uh, rural areas, basically covered by vegetarians, since the vegetarians have low albedo, albedos. But in cities, in urban areas, this reflection, okay, this reflection process becomes significant. We cannot ignore it. But uh, even for ArcGIS Pro, it has not established this uh, functionality, especially for 3D uh, urban surfaces. So my idea is that we utilize the uh, rooftop uh, polygons enriched with the height attribute to build this rooftop area and to build this uh, facade area, vertical surfaces. For example, here we have four different directions uh, in different phase two, four different directions. And in, at a specific location and instant of time, we can also estimate this uh, solar irradiation. I wrote as uh, SR, solar uh, radiation as 3D vector. So these two parallel 3D vectors will intersect on, the, uh, on these uh, two vertex. Okay, so it will marked as the blue intersection line, which will also form this gray shadow polygon. The same for plot B, uh, if the rooftop is concave polygon, so it can also intersect on the facade of its own building. Okay, looks like this. And even uh, uh, the surrounding buildings may also create the shadow effects, okay, or block, uh, block the this uh, sunshine okay so basically when we do this model the, basically it's a physics model this based on the complex combination of these uh, very basic and simple three scenarios we consider the effect from geo location referring to the latitude of the city historical cloud coverage uh generally we uh, connected, let's say, three to five years historical uh, data about cloud coverage to determine transmittivity and diffuse proportion to quantify the land surface solar irradiation without any shading effect. Okay, And then we model this shading effect based on this. Uh, we also consider multiple reflections. So based on these multiple reflections, we can determine the homogeneous light field, the concentrated light field, even the dispersive light field, okay? Now, the next question is, how can we determine different solar irradiation in each specific location? So this is how we achieve it. 
uh, uh, look, this this is not from the uh, 3D light lidar data. Okay, we generate these uh, 3D uh, point clouds from the these uh, 3D buildings, which means, for example, here the spatial resolution is one meter, which means one dot, one point, one dot uh, will take one square meter area. Okay, so in this case, the, the solar irradiation recorded in this. Uh, dot will represent the solar potential in this uh, unit area. Uh, I'm not going too much details for the algorithm. Uh, here, we uh, essentially all the data set is in 3D. I just visualized in 2D here. As you can see, for example, this is blue uh, polygon represent the shadow polygon that will intersect on the rooftop marked as the blue light segment versus intersects on facade marked as this red uh, light segment, okay? So this is the uh, output. Plot A shows the boundary information urban areas either in shadow or in sunshine. B is the result after the first reflection. C is the art meter step after the multiple reflect reflections. Based on my empirical uh, or my uh, personal experience, usually we do the iterative or computation for around three to four times, okay? So then most uh, of the radiation will approach to the sky. Uh, we built this model in uh, post-SQL, supported by post -GIS. And uh, uh, we also developed this JavaScript uh, in Java Eclipse to call multiple functions. Uh, in parallel. So we developed, basically, we let's say we established uh, 10 databases independently in our computer. So we call these uh, 10 databases independently so we can achieve parallel computation, okay, to fully utilize the CPU resources. Uh, this is this strategy about big data computation. But for sure, there are many strategies for improvement uh, of the database, uh, of the database computation but I'm not doing too much details for this. We also did, did the field measurement. We measured the solar irradiation on the uh, ground, on rooftop, and on the facade. So in, for this figure, in the x-axis, norm means we do not include the reflection module. 0 0.25 to 0 0.4 means the increase of the albedo. Okay? And in the y-axis, that is relative error. So basically, uh, we see with the increase of albedo, we see, uh, we achieve the uh, gradual decrease of the relative error. However, you see for side one and side two on rooftop, uh, the error stays the same. The reason is that these two sites are located at a very top level, high level, which means there's no contribution from other reflections. Now. <laughs> There is a limitation in this step. We were lacking the albedo information for this city scale uh, urban surfaces. So we just simply um, find the commonly seen materials and we calculated the average albedo with an equal interval for uh, testing. Okay, But uh, after that, we did the uh, 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 calculated the 10 different cities across the globe. In some cities, we have two study areas, such as in Los Angeles. One study area is located in the downtown area. Basically, we have high density of tall buildings versus we have a residential area. Basically, we have low density of uh, low buildings, right? So the good thing is that in this case, even in the same city, we have almost the same condition. We can investigate the influence of the urban morphology on the solar 3D solar capacity, that's the annual solar potential, okay, influenced by the urban morphology. Uh, further on, uh, we did the solar light field distribution pattern analyze. Let me explain this uh, in detail. Let's say, look at a plot A. For this blue solid curve, here we have a blue dot. So this means, this means in this solid blue curve, we utilize at least 
25% of the maximum solar potential. Okay, that is the threshold. So in this precondition, we can find at least 15% of the urban surfaces in this study area, okay? For these 15% urban surfaces, each surface, let's say one rooftop or one facade, we can find at least 18% of the area that satisfy this condition. This condition means uh, uh, at least 18% of area in this surface has the uh, solar potential larger than 25% of the maximum solar irradiation. Okay, a little bit complicated, right? But uh, the good thing is in this case, we can uh, clearly choose the light field distribution patterns and then we can easily find the solar uh, accumulation areas, okay? Then I would like to ask a question. So to answer a scientific question. So what is a good city to use solar energy in a global scale? Uh, to answer this question, I firstly propose several incidents to represent the urban morphology in each area, okay? Such as this uh, uh, standard deviation of the height on horizontal surfaces. So this means uh, uh, the buildings, uh, if we have the homogeneous height of the buildings, then the standard deviation will be zero, right? If the buildings height are up and down with larger uh, uh, fraction, then the standard deviation could be large. So based on this, uh, we have the correlation analyzed. In the x-axis, that is the annual solar potential in each study area. In the y-axis, that is the solar, uh, this uh, urban morphology incidence we calculated. So basically from plot B to plot H, we have strong and positive correlations at a global scale, right? Look at plot A. Here in the y-axis, that is cosine alpha. Alpha stands for the latitude of city. So in this case, R, Pearson correlation coefficient equaling minus 0 0.47. Okay, so what does this mean from this result? So this means the location of the city in the global scale is not a conclusive factor to the annual solar capacity versus the urban morphology strongly affects the solar capacity of three cities. Even more specifically, as we calculate 10 different cities, we find that Singapore is one of the best cities to use solar energy versus uh, it is a little bit challenging for Hong Kong to, to utilize the uh, solar energy effectively, okay? We also posted some information in the uh, MIT Singapore City Lab website and also my personal uh, website, okay? Now, we built the fundamental GIS dataset. We built this light field uh, distribution model. Then the next question is, how can we utilize these light resources uh, effectively, okay? Now, we, there are many different ways to utilize light resource, such as urban greenery, right? This is in a very famous hotel in Singapore, okay? Or we can cool down the air temperatures. We can also do the rooftop urban farming. This is uh, one site in Hong Kong. Uh, or we may have the solar, solar photovoltaic farming. Let's say, gener uh, simply to say that is generated electricity by using solar panels stored on the rooftop. Now, if we look at this third uh, application, here I raised some very important and critical question. First, what is the utilization uh, uh, target? Is Should we try to get as much electricity as possible? Or is the target that is trying to get the largest economic benefit? Or we try to maximize the uh, environmental impacts such as uh, carbon mitigation. So we should think about this to start with. The second question, what is the development priority? Should we, to start with, just install PVs on rooftop? That could be the highest priority. 
or followed by a facade and ground, or even we install PVs uh, integrated with the sun shading boards. We have to think the, about this. I think in different locations uh, or in different cities, the answer could be different. Let's say in Nordic countries with a high latitude, maybe uh, PVs installed on facade is a good idea, right? So the third question, what is the usage effectiveness? Should we consider this tidal phenomena of the electricity use, uh, usages? Uh, for example, so the electricity usage patterns between the uh, offices, office buildings, and the residential buildings should be opposite from Monday to Friday, generally to say, right? And should we consider uh, develop an independent smart grid, which means the generated electricity is used by the buildings itself? Okay, or should we connect to the utility grid so the generated electricity will su supply to the national grid to and transmit to other locations? So we should make it clear, at least in a, in a logical thinking, uh, we have this hierarchical uh, design or architecture. Okay, so during the recent uh, years, uh, let's say let's follow this uh, the first question. Uh, utilization target. Uh, I considered the electricity generation. I answered the question, what is appropriate spatial optimization to maximize the PV electricity generation while maxim minimize the use used urban services. Further on, I considered the economic feasibility issue. What is a feasible spatial optimization of a PV area and location? to ensure a satisfactory economic performance during the whole life cycle of the PV system, that's a 25 years time, okay? And even recently, uh, we quantified the carbon mitigation potential. What is the carbon mitigation uh, capability for the, let's say for the rooftop PV uh, area, of rooftop PVs, which, uh, uh, which are instantly influenced by dynamic geo environments. Okay, uh, due to the time limitation, I'm not going to uh, go too much details, but I'd like to focus on this economic feasibility issue. Okay, L let's first discuss this one, uh, the economic fe uh, feasible optimization. Uh, okay, so in this study, we tried to develop a special temporal analytic model and a tank economic assessment model to optimize PV proportion, to ensure that a PV system can meet the electricity demand and obtain reasonable profit simultaneously. And we want to maximize the uh, electricity generation and at the same time minimize the occupied urban service, which also means the, the small to minimize the installed PV area, okay? Now, this is the uh, uh, framework. We utilize the historic weather data and the 3D building data and based on the light field modeling, okay, we just, uh, I just presented to estimate the solar distribution. Then to start with, we optimize the priority of using different parts of urban services, followed by optimization uh, of PV uh, capacity based on the real electricity demand from the then the optimization of PV capacity based on economic feasibility assessment. Uh, in this study, we select New York City. Specifically, we focused on uh, Brooklyn district. The reason is that in this area, we can get the real electricity consumption data in each individual building. So that's why we select this study area. Okay. So if we look at plot A here, this means uh, the average electricity generation uh, in different hours across the different months from January, January to December. Plot B, that is the accumulation of the electricity generation in different months, but participated by uh, partition, but partitioned by the ground, rooftop, and the facade. And plot C is for simply for visualization. Okay. Uh, this figure shows the real electricity consumption data. Uh, BID here, BID equals 11, which means the building ID, okay? So this pink curve 
stands for real electricity demand. The green curve uh, means the electricity generation from rooftop. And uh, the blue curve means the electricity generation on the 3D urban surfaces, including rooftop and facade. Okay. Also, as I presented just now, we also did the solar light field distribution pattern analysis. I'm not going to much details here. Then uh, we proposed two solutions to, to support this uh, real electricity demand. One is we call it uh, self-reliance, which means uh, uh, it's like an independent smart grid. Okay, The generated electricity can only be used by the building itself. Or we seek external support, which means we can install PVs from the uh, its neighborhood buildings, and we support to uh, each specific buildings. Okay, these these two different solutions. So for plot A, uh, this epsilon means uh, the threshold uh, equals zero point nine, which means uh, we can use at least ninety percent of the maxima electricity, oh, sorry, solar potential, that is going to be a threshold. So in this case, if we have a larger uh, rate, the total generated electricity could be small. But for the unit area, the unit electricity generation could be the la largest, right? And for numbers n equals one to eight, which means that we utilize just uh, one surrounding building or eight surrounding buildings, okay? Uh, the dashed black curve stands for the real electricity demand. So according to this plot, uh, you can easily see that, for example, in January and December, it's I would say it's impossible to achieve self-reliance, right? And in other months, let's say in August, if uh, we have lower, which means epsilon equals 0 0.4, then basically, basically, uh, the generated electricity it generated electricity is larger than the demand in the same months okay so that's the how we we quantify this uh, relationship then we consider four uh very strict strict scenarios we assume the electricity price is always the same during the 25 years uh, life circle and we have a long linear decrease for PV conversion efficiency, decrease of PV efficiency, which means uh, uh, the PV module, PV cell, uh, the brand new that is around 24% or 22%, but it, it, is, it is decreasing gradually, okay? And also we have a long linear increase for the maintenance cost, and there's no financial support from, from the government. We also consider this uh, depression rate uh, equals 1% uh, 1 every year, 2% every year, and 3% every year. And uh, this uh, maintenance cost is uh, 0.3% in all these three scenarios. Now, we find that in the x-axis, that is the payback period. Okay, In the y-axis, that is the, the solar PV intensity that needs to be harvested. So if we look at this dot, okay, this dot, uh, this means if we utilize 17% uh, of the maximized solar radiation here, and if uh, <clears throat> the PV degradation rate is 1%, uh, then we will get our investment back in 13 years, 13 years. Okay, uh, here, uh, sorry, I have to mention this uh, roughly uh, rifle fit and new means, uh, this means the building has been there. We add or uh, install PVs on existing buildings. And new here means we uh, install PVs on newly built buildings. So in this case, in the same condition, either we utilize 70% for the maxima solar radiation and the PV degradation rate is 1% every year. In this case, the payback time will be 10 years, three years shorter than this scenario, okay? So which means for the rest of the years, we can get a net profit. Now, uh, 
this is for self-reliance. SR, ES means uh, external support. We find that, for example, if we look at it here, if the uh, degradation rate is 1%, roughly we can get our investment back around 10 years. And for the next 15 years, we can get a night profit at this amount, roughly 40 million US dollars in that study area. Okay. Uh, this is getting uh, better. Okay. So, which means uh, if we have the same condition, the payback time is around eight to nine years. And uh, when I calculated this, I was totally shocked. So, I thought, wow, wow, it's so amazing. We can own so much money. Did I did something wrong? So we made a double check. And, the, and uh, two years ago or three years ago, we re at least I realized that, wow, so that's a really good business. That's why, why there are so many capitals invest millions of US dollars in this uh, specific field. Okay. Now the, uh, here, we also show the, uh, we also show the, uh, the installer area for the PVs, okay? Uh, now, let me go through the next section about the, how we charge the shared e-scooters uh, to, to, by using the solar, distributed solar potential, okay? Now, we, uh, we have two study areas. One is in the downtown area in Singapore. The other is here, basically, it is the National University of Singapore. We utilize the real shared e-scoot data set from Grab and Neuron to Unicom, okay? Uh, so we have a departure and uh, returning locations, and we do the special clustering to determine these uh, uh, stations, okay? Uh, now we assume we have the shortest pass uh, for shared e-scooters and shared bikes. So we created this heat count of the pass produced by shared bikes and shared scooters. And here I found a very critical issue Look at this uh, in this red uh, box. This is in the downtown area of Singapore. For shared e-scooters, 58.48% of the trips were made not by the users, but by the employees, okay? And for 26%, it used for repositioning to meet the real demand from users, while the rest of 31% is used for charging, which means this is a charging chip. We quantify this when after a trip, the battery level will immediately jump to a high level, such as, for example, to before a trip, the battery level is 14%. Finish, when this trip is finished, it becomes 100%. So we quantify it, uh, we, we determine this uh, charging chip. So this counts for 31.6%. This is, this is a really large number. Think about it. Two Unicom, Lean, it pays around three to 12 US dollars to charge one scooter versus the bird pays $5 for each. This is US dollar. So what does it mean? This means, for example, you use your mobile, mobile phone, you pick up uh, a scooter and bring it back to your home. You charge this scooter and re return it to a specific or predefined location. Then the company will pay you five US dollars. Okay, that's the business. So think about it. In Marilla Bay, downtown area of Singapore, uh, and in US, okay, four weeks of time. If we paid at the bird pace, we need to pay at least thirty-four thousand US dollars. What happens for over the year? If we assume we have the same charging intensity, that's going to be more than four hundred thousand US dollars. Then what happens for the city, like Los Angeles? Okay, that could be millions of US dollars only used for charging. Okay, this is because we need the manpower to reposition these scooters frequently in different locations for charging. Okay, this is how they did uh, for charging scooters. I took these photos years ago. Okay, and uh, my finding was also proved by reports that electronic scooter charging is a cut through business and Lim wants to fix that. So, to Solve this problem, we propose our solution. That is solar charging. So scooters, which means scooters can uh, get a solar charging when they are parking at the stations during the daytime, okay? 
So, so in this very simple idea, we we calculate the hourly uh, solar distribution in each specific location, and based on the charging station, we can estimate how much electricity generated accordingly. Okay, so that's why we have for the estimation of the solar potential on 3D urban surfaces. And we can estimate the solar charging when they are parking stations. We consider the PV size, PV efficiency, the lay installation layout, geolocation, location, et cetera. Okay. So the battery increase uh, will increase uh, when scooters get solar charging, and the battery, the battery will decrease when scooters are moving. Now, here we also develop a battery aware real-time shareability network. We consider the real-time weather condition. We do the real-time simulation of on demands and the availability, availability of shared scooters. So scooters get solar charging when they're parking the stations and the scooters, the electricity will detect it when they are moving. We also proposed an IoT solution, uh, which allow users to make a reservation. That's a five or 10 minutes ahead of time. So we can borrow these five or 10 minutes at the backside in the server, we can do the systematic optimization. Okay, for the global optimization to maximize the serving rate and minimize the total cheaper distance, which also means the less energy consumption and less waiting time. Now, we find that if we, in this case, we only need around 24 to 67% of the scooters uh, to serve nearly 100% of rare chips, when the reservation time is 10 minutes, and if in this case, in the downtown area of Singapore, we only need one square meter PV size at each station. In NUS, National University of Singapore, at each station, we need a 3.25 square meters PV size. And in total, that's gonna to be 39 and 91 square meters, okay, for two independent small study area. Now, someone asked me, Hi, yeah, Ray, Felix. Yeah, this seems a good result and a good solution. But what happens if there's no solar charging due to continuous cloudy or rainy days? Well, actually, actually, this is the concern about the stability of such a system because we consider solar energy is unstable. So to answer this question, I did a dream test. I assume there's no solar charging at all. For each independent experiment, each scooter will have the full battery level from 150 watt hour to 900. So we do six independent experiments, respectively for Marilla Bay, downtown area, and the US. So in this case, still we can find we can achieve, or we can successfully serve more than 90% of the trips for 20 days in Marilla Bay and three days in US. So what does this mean? So this means that we can achieve nearly a 98% reduction for charging chips. If we pay at bird pace, $5 for each, then we can save more than 35,000 US dollars for two small areas, four weeks of time. We also build a, a web page that allows users to, to change the input parameters, let's say the waiting a reservation time, the PV size to see the performance of the system. So, in this study, I would argue that solar energy, when we consider solar energy, it is not only about the cost of electricity. It can also bring significant social and economic impacts because of the way we use it. So also because of this uh, project, a company in California, uh, they, very, they were very interested in this solution. They want to build such a solution with the parking, uh, shared parking service uh, to make a test. Okay, in United States. That's a very short discussion. Now let's go back to let's go back to this image. Now think about it. how can we solve this light pollution? Let's say. Do you have any ideas? Now this is the how they solve the problem. They use a very large and black carpet covering over this tall building on facade. Yes, it seems we solve this uh, uh, light pollution problem, but at the same time, we lost the nature view from office, right? And we can also in increase the air temperatures. So in this case, 
we have some discussions. Uh, I raised as a questions, what is the definition of light pollution? What is the spatial temporal distribution of light pollution? What are the effective ways to protect our light environment? And even how about the light time light field? Because the whole of this presentation, we discussed the daytime light field. Okay. So now uh, we think geo, GIS or geoscience can achieve this since we produce uh, 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 we can produce a spatial temporal big data. We can do the modeling. We can reveal the changes of a solar distribution. We can balance the electricity supply and the demand. And even we can provide science theory and technologies by relying on geoscience. But at the same time, we call the uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, collaboration uh, from different backgrounds, not only from uh, geoscience or or geography. Okay, yeah, that's that's whole my today's presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zubody. Great. Uh presentation and uh, so next we have time for questions let me change the settings anyone in the audience want to ask questions uh, you can uh, unmute yourself so um i will just let the audience uh, wait and ask questions so uh, in terms of the uh, solar panel so i'm aware in the us I'm not quite sure about the, uh, I mean, the situation uh, in Singapore and other countries, but from what I've heard that, uh, so in the U.S. here, even with all the, um, even if the federal government subsidize some of the costs, and usually I think it takes like ten, some like thirteen years, just to break even, uh, with all the federal like um, uh, benefits, but if those are gone, it's I mean, we download the uh, benefits. It, it take probably more longer than uh, fifteen years, and most of the people need to like pay a large amount, like lump sum, at the beginning for all the installation and uh, all the construction stuff. So it kind of is not like I mean, financially, it's a big burden for I mean consumers. So how about the situation in Singapore? Like how um does the government like uh, handle this kind of situation so that it makes it easy for I mean, more people like to use, but if you like have a hefty cost at the beginning, then they don't really have the motivation actually to adopt and then to install solar panels uh, on their rooftop. Uh, so far as I know, in United in the United States, now some companies, when they make a contract with the clients, they mm -hmm. guarantee every month or a mm -hmm. certain period of time their product, let's say the PVs will generate a certain amount of electricity. Mm -hmm. If, if for example, I, I guarantee in this month we can generate 300 mm -hmm. kilowatt of electricity, but in reality, they only generate 25 or uh, 215 uh, kilowatt, uh, kilowatt uh, electricity, then the company will pay for the last of this 50 kilowatt electricity. So there is guarantee to encourage users in United States. Mm -hmm. So in Singapore, now, uh, the, there are two situations. First, uh, the government are trying to promote this solution. And we've already mm. installed uh, large PV areas on rooftops. Well, for example, HDBs, which means that these buildings are essentially uh, built by the government. That takes uh, 18 Five percent of the of hope the residential buildings. So this uh, will support the national grid, and for mm -hmm. landed property like independent houses, uh, the richer people they can mm -hmm. afford this uh, the, the to start with a large amount of money investment for the installation. They they don't care about it. The mm -hmm. as long as the, the the company can guarantee, okay. For this year or this month, you can generate how much electricity. So I think that's that's the situation in, in Singapore. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, there's a question in the chat um, uh, from uh, Wu Shen Biao. So the kind of a two part uh, questions. 
the first one is some uh, cities may not have fine resolution LiDAR data uh, in China. So how can we model the light uh, urban over those cities that without uh, LiDAR data? How can we model light uh, of these cities? So basically, uh, there is no LiDAR, right? Like most of those are need very fine scale data to do the uh, uh, simulation and the modeling. But without the LiDAR data, is there some kind of alternative that we can still do this kind of uh, modeling? I think uh, possibly there are two ways. The first, as I just presented, we also realize this, uh, this challenge due to the lack of the, let's say, 3D building data set in some cities. So mm -hmm. that's why we try to build these 3D city mm -hmm. models purely based on high spatial resolution of uh, the optical satellite imagery. And it tests good in, in Shanghai. This is one possible possibly. The second, instead of using the physical model, we can utilize the parameterized based model. Uh, Essentially, we have already published some papers, and I uh, supervised a PhD in, from Hong Kong, from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, now, instead of using the uh, physical model, we consider the influential factors of this uh, solid distribution, such as uh, the building's height, uh, the orientation, and uh, the urban morphology incidence. I just proposed that we. Uh, simply build the machine learning models, how these influential factors determine uh, and quantify the rooftop solar potential. Uh, yeah, that's the other solution. But but for sure, that is not so much accurate than the physics model. Yeah. Hopefully, I answered your first question. Thank you. The second one is like, uh, it mentioned that you use some GS software in the uh, models, for example, post GS. And uh, so uh, he was asking about the efficiency of the tool for citywide computation. And would the AI help uh, uh, some of these, uh, resolving some of these issues? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, yeah. Uh, even although we uh, improved the uh, computational efficiency in the database in many different ways. Uh, still, the performance is not that good, I would say. The reason is that we this physical model I presented heavily rely on the heavy computation, such as the uh, 3D solar irradiation will intersect on the 3D urban surfaces. So each solar uh, 3D vector will associate dozens of point clouds to redistribute the solar potential. So this computation is very heavy and we could easily generate millions of uh, records in the table. So that makes the computation slow. Uh, so we haven't tested the whole of Singapore, but we test many smaller areas. Uh, I. I cannot tell an exact number for how much time we cost, because since we never did this for whole of Singapore. Yes, I agree with you. And I also believe AI models can be helpful. And also that's what I mentioned just now in, in answering your first question. We, we are trying to developing the uh, machine learning models. And even now we are trying to developing the uh, transformer models uh, to address this issue uh, yeah okay thank my... you and uh, any other questions from the audience if you want to unmute yourself uh, this was another one from uh, Wu Dong I found you mentioned the scooters and the plane for PV charger stations in Singapore I'm confused that if this plane could be suitable for uh, electric vehicle charger stations because they are more and more um electric vehicles and um, stations uh, in China. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, we have to consider the scalability issue if yeah. there are more charging demand. Now, at least the best on real data set, real data set in Singapore, it tests good. Uh, actually, 
the electricity, the power uh, requirement for scooters is rather small. It's significantly smaller than EVs, okay? So one kilowatt electricity can support such a long time than EVs. Now, if we want to find a, a, a adaptive solution when there are more scooters, I think there are two ways. First, do not do the, this uh, distributed uh, PV system. We may install, uh, let's say, uh, the rooftop PV system or even the utility scale uh, PV system to support uh, this uh, uh, scooter. So I think that is the uh, right way. Hopefully I answered your question. Uh, Hu Dong? Yes. I okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's about time. And I was thinking because uh, early when you mentioned about the scooters, right there, are, I mean, in the US here, uh, we don't have that many like uh, electric scooters right now on the street. It used to have a lot, but I think some of the company that uh, went bankrupt. So, but from my observation, uh, I don't know how much it's really being used. For example, even those uh, scooters that keep like on the street, it's keep uh, requiring the battery to send those GPS and those coordinates. I don't know about the energy consumption, the basically the uh, efficiency, but it we're interested to see like how much are actually wasted, right? So you are, it's keep charging and then it's like, but it's not being used. Uh, how, how, that's one of the reasons that some of the companies that don't make enough money to sustain uh, to have those uh, uh, scooters. So, for example, on campus uh, at the University of Tennessee, I've only seen like a couple, right? It used to, uh, a couple years ago, it used to be quite a lot, but now not many. It's only like maybe just one company. So, yeah, it's interesting to see how this like actually evolve and uh, which company can actually last uh, longer time than most of uh, their competitors. Okay, uh, thank you everyone for your uh, uh, attending and um, and thank you for the questions. Uh, hopefully we'll see you again uh, next week. And uh, thank you Dr. Zhu once again for the uh, great uh, presentation and uh, thank you for all your participation. Take care thank everyone. You. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'll upload the videos later, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you.